Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the NLN Education Summit 2017. We are about to start the program now. I can see one of them. You can't see the one? I can see one. Oh, good, good, good. Welcome to the 2017 Summit. On behalf of the, Na of the Board of Governors and the staff of the National League for Nursing, I welcome you to this summit, our community of colleagues. Today we join together in celebration of nurse educators and our impact on the profession and on humanity as a whole. During these times of immense natural disasters, the NLN recognizes and honors all nurses and health professions in our community of colleagues, those who have stepped up to help others, often leaving our own homes and their own families in order to serve humankind. Thank you for your work, especially as these disasters continue to have an impact on so many stricken communities and individuals. Now we have a special surprise for you all. I've asked Beth to do the honors and explain what goes on. As you all know, we love to use the summit to mark special occasions. This year, we have so many things to celebrate, and we couldn't think of a better one to kick off our community of colleagues gathering than 10,000 happy birthdays. In many parts of the world, the day of birth is a day of celebration. But in the world's poorest countries, the day of birth is the most dangerous day in a baby's and mother's life. Every year, 300,000 mothers and 2.7 million newborns die on the day of birth. Most of these lives can be saved. Through the 10,000 Happy Birthdays Project, supported by Laredal Global Health, the International Confederation of Midwives, the Association of Malawi Midwives, and the Midwifery Association of Zambia have trained more than 9,000 maternal and newborn care providers in almost all districts. <laughs> and that includes nursing schools in those two countries. You'll hear much more about it at the NL booth, NLN's booth, Birthday Bash. But I don't want you to have to wait any longer for our surprise. After a short video describing some of these life-saving activities, we will all have the thrill of hearing a young woman rapper who has been helping with the 10,000 Happy Birthdays Project through her songs Happy birthday and change. Colleagues, please put your hands together 
for the UNICEF Goodwill Ambassador to Ethiopia, Abalone. No mother should lose her life while giving life. No child should be deprived of his mother's loving arms. No girl should bear a child while being a child herself. No family should lose their girls due to childbirth. My name is Avalon Melissa and I am the UNICEF National Ambassador to Ethiopia. Ending child marriage can improve the health of women and girls. Girls are more likely to experience complications like obstetric fistula during pregnancy and childbirth. Early pregnancies are not only dangerous for girls but also to their children. By delaying early marriage and pregnancy, we can save a girl's life. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah. How many women in this earth have to die due to pregnancy? This thing is weighing heavy on me. Unacceptable rates. This is not right. We cannot stand and look without a fight. But thank God for the people with a good heart. Working hard to prevent it. So many mothers died and children left alone without their mothers. It's time for us to stand together, help one another, save the life of moms and their babies. The truth is they need the right care. Step by step, we can get there. We should never lose hope, even if we hear sad stuff on the news all day. Cause hope is all we got in this world, yeah. And I know we can all make a change. It's unfortunate it shouldn't be this way. So I bow down on my knees and I pray. I say, I want change. We can change. If we feel it could have been me or you. It could have been me or you. Yeah, I need a change. We can change. If we feel it could have been me or you. It could have been me or you. Yeah. The problem is there are enough people to provide the care that is needed. I cannot believe it. Pregnant woman walking long distance before to reach the place of care. Oh my dear, sometimes they don't make it in time. Leading to the death of their baby. This is so crazy. I write these words to share it to the world because it's affecting me. And I know God is protecting me. I didn't live that life, so it's hard to imagine. But all I know that it's not fair. I swear, I always see a light at the end of the tunnel. We got to keep our head up through all of the struggles. Life ain't supposed to be easy, but we can make a change. Believe me, yeah, together we can make it happen. Sing. We can make it happen. I won't change. We can change. If we feel it could have been me or you. It could have been me or you. Yeah, I need a change. We can change. If we feel it could have been me or you. It could have been me or you. Say, I won't change. We can change if we feel it could have been me or you. It could have been me or you, yeah. Yeah, we can make a change, yeah. Say, we can make a change, yeah. We can make a change, yeah. We can make a change, yeah. Together, we can make a change, yeah. We can make a change, yeah. We can make a change, yeah. Sing, sing, sing. I won't change. We can change. If we feel it could have been me or you. It could have been me or you. Yeah, I need a change. We can change. If we feel it could have been me or you. It could have been me or you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much.
colleagues, for each birthing simulator purchased through the Buy One, Gift One initiative, a second one is being donated to a low-income country. Please join us in the NLN booth at 6.30 p.m. to learn how you can participate in this life-saving initiative. Enjoy this presentation about the initiative. Every year, 300,000 women die during pregnancy and childbirth. Almost 3 million babies die during or soon after birth. Nearly all of these deaths occur in developing countries. This kind of inequity is found in no other area of healthcare. Most of these deaths could be prevented if birth attendants around the world had the necessary skills and competencies to manage life-threatening complications around the time of birth. The Mama Natalie Birthing Simulator was developed to help prevent the leading cause of maternal death, postpartum hemorrhage. The new simulator, Mama Birthy, addresses normal births as well as common complications. For each Mama Natalie and Mama Birthy purchased through Lairdal Medical for use in high-income countries, one will be donated to a low-income country. The NLN has already helped us provide over 4,000 birthing simulators to low resource settings. These have been used to train thousands and thousands of birth attendants. And can you imagine if they, as a result of this, could save one more life each of those birth attendants? We'd like to make an even bigger impact. We believe you can help. Your training can make a difference. Each and every one of us is tied to a community of colleagues who are dedicated to healing, promotion of health, hope, and saving lives. By joining the Laird All program, Buy One, Gift One, we all have the opportunity to make the difference in the lives of others in developing countries who share the same values we do but lack the resources. Let's make that difference. What a performance, what a message, what an opportunity. And I would also like to take a moment, because I realize a lot of you don't know who we are, <laughs> Uh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Ann Bevere, I'm the president, and this is Beverly Malone, our CEO. The Shrinking Violet. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's my great pleasure to introduce my fellow members of the NLN Board of Governors. I'm thankful for their wisdom every day during my tenure as president of this league. Colleagues, Please stand as I call your name. President-elect Rume Alexander. Secretary Teresa Schellenbarger. Treasurer Patricia Yoder-Wise. David Johnson. June Larson. John Lundeen. Anne-Marie Morrow. Linda Monaghan. Michael Newsom, Janet Phillips-Nice. Kathleen Stevens and Lynette Walford. <laughs> Next, a heartfelt thanks to our past presidents. The NLN as a whole and the current league leadership are critical to our ability to call ourselves the voice for nursing education. But we rest on the great strength of our past leadership. If you are present, please stand and remain standing so we can celebrate your invaluable contributions. Once all names are called, we'll have a grand applause. Marcia Adams, Judith Halstead, Kathleen Schultz, 
Elaine Tagliarini, Tony Bargagliotti, Joyce Murray, Nancy Langston, Sheila Ryan, Jean Watson, Carol Lindemann, Claire Fagan, Patty Hoffman, and Sister Rosemary Donnelly. Thank you all. Before I continue, I want to join my president in sending out our heartfelt wishes for healing and safety to our colleagues in Texas, Florida, and all along the East Coast. I would say that it's bigger than just the United States or the land that we call the United States. I want us to remember our colleagues in the U.S. Virgin Islands. I want us to remember Puerto Rico and Cuba. I want us to remember all those affected by the storms. And it's not just the water, colleagues. It is also the fire. And so it is with a lot of uh, gratitude for all the providers that were there and made a difference. I just want to add my warmest thoughts and prayers to those of our president as we send out a shout here from the Inner Lens 2017 Summit. <laughs> and what would we do without in our incomparable NLN ambassadors, who you have heard me call my ninja team? who bring the NLN to campuses and health institutions, institutions from coast to coast. Many ambassadors are here today. Those ninjas, you never know where they are. Please stand for some well-deserved applause. <laughs> and by the way, if you are interested in becoming an ambassador, please contact our membership department. They will be so glad to hear from you. Next, we would like to acknowledge the stellar fellows of the NLN Academy of Nursing Education. The class of 2017 will be inducted during the Honors Convocation on Saturday afternoon. Will those proud carriers of the letters A-N-E-F. After their names, please stand. Also being feted at the Honors Convocation on Saturday afternoon, are the new and redesignated Centers of Excellence in Nursing Education. But let's not wait until then to acknowledge all who have the exemplary teachers who comprise the COE nurse educators from both academic and health centers. Would you please join me in a round of applause as our COE colleagues stand? The Academic Certified Nurse Educator Program has grown in numbers to almost 8,000, and we continue to certify colleagues around the world, and we have more in that pipeline. You'll hear more about this later in the summit, but in the meantime, CNEs who are in the room, please stand and applaud and wave those red bags. <laughs> We are so very pleased to acknowledge the NLN Commission for Nursing Education Accreditation, NLNCNEA, all leaders in nursing education and nursing practice, led by Chair Kathleen Schultz. Please also join us in recognizing our NLN subsidiary affiliate colleagues from the NLNCNE Commission Chair Kathleen Pondexter, the chair of the NL, and Kathleen, if you're here, I'd love for you to stand. The chair for the Foundation for Nursing Education, Cole Edmondson, and the leaders of ASIN, 
Catherine McJanet, and Marcel Stoll. Please join me in giving them a round of applause. You all know that the NLN's mission is supported across the country through the 25 constituent leagues currently serving 27 states. Join me in acknowledging their vital role. Presidents of the constituent leagues, please stand as Anne or I call your name. Colleagues, please hold your applause until the end. In alphabetical order by state, they are Tedra Smith from the great state of Alabama, Karen Sherrill from the Arizona League, hailing from the Connecticut League, Suzanne Dean, Lisa Jordan from the DC Maryland League, Ruby Alvarez from the Florida League, from the Illinois League, Carmela Michael, and from the Indiana League, Susan Seibert. From the Iowa League, Kathy Black. From the Kentucky League, I was born in Kentucky, none but Beth McGinnis. Antoinette Jefferson from the Louisiana League. Patricia Demers from the Massachusetts Rhode Island League. From the Michigan League, Katie Kessler. From the Missouri League, Peggy Neal Lewis. And please continue. Thank you. Lori Thompson from the Nebraska League. From the New Jersey League, Donna Murray. Diane Lou Snyder from the New York League. From the North Carolina League, Terry Ward. Hope Moon from the Ohio League. Eileen Stevens from the Oklahoma League. From the Pennsylvania League, Diane Wyland. Ruth Whitman Price from the South Carolina League. From the Texas League, my home state, Alice Ashcroft. Laura Lee Whitten from the Virginia League, Joseph Trader from the West Virginia League, and Suzanne Williamson from the Wisconsin League. These colleagues from the constituent leagues, they are the front door of the National League for Nursing. Please make sure as you see them around that you say hello to them. The NLN is lucky to have so many friends and partners to acknowledge. So please join with Anne and myself as we salute them. First up are our colleagues on the Tri-Council for Nursing. You know it's four of us, but we still call ourselves the Tri-Council. <laughs> and the work we do together as leaders in American nursing. Please hold your applause until we read all the names. The President and Chief Executive Officer of the American Association of Colleges of Nursing, Deborah Troutman, and Chair of the AACN Board, Julianne Sebastian, President Pamela Cipriano, Vice President Ernest Grant, and Chief Executive Officer Marla Weston from the American Nurses Association, and from the American Organization of Nurse Executives, President Joan Clark, and Chief Executive Officer Maureen Zwick, President Eric Williams of the National Black Nurses Association, and Executive Director Millicent Gorm. Please join me in a round of applause. We'd also like to recognize these leaders as they stand. From the National Student Nurses Association, Executive Director Diane Mancino, President Jennifer Kalinkowski, and NLN consultant to the NSNA, Cheryl Taylor, Kathy Catrabone, President, and Pat Thompson, CEO of Sigma Theta Tau International, HRSA Acting Director, Commander Joel Nelson. Donna Mayer, CEO of the AAOADN. 
the Organization for Associate Degree Nursing. You got a tongue tied representing the Commission on Graduates of Foreign Nursing Schools International, Julia Todecker, President Christina Dreifurst from the International Association of Clinical Simulation and Learning, known as INAXEL, NCSBN President Catherine Thomas and CEO David Benton. Colleagues, we are also very thrilled to welcome very special guests from China. Mr. Yang Wang, Project Manager from the National Center for Schooling Development Program, Ministry of Education, People's Republic of China. <laughs> Mr. Wang is joined by five faculty from China. The NLN, and with the five faculty, please stand to be acknowledged. <laughs> the NLN has developed a joint project with the Ministry of Education in China and Laerdal China to bring simulation-based teaching practices to selected schools of nursing in China. Please also join me in welcoming our colleagues from China to the United States and to the NLN Summit. And I would just ask you once again, as you see our colleagues in the hallways, stop and say hello. In addition, I would like to recognize another colleague from China, Li Hong Gong, Vice President and Secretary General of Guanhong International Education Association, GIA and the Guanghong International Nursing Education Alliance. Dia's philosophy is to promote nursing in China, education, and in its community, and organize educators and scientific researchers to advocate the spirit of collaboration, innovation, and development internationally. Please stand, Lisa, and be recognized. The NLN is also grateful to the following individuals and organizations for their willingness to partner with the League. Your vision and leadership are invaluable to the NLN and to the future of nursing. Many of you are here today. Please stand as your name is called. From Chamberlain College of Nursing, President Susan Grunwald. From Excelsior College, we are, we're trying to hold it to the end, but if your hands will keep going, that's fine with me. <laughs> From Excelsior College, President James Baldwin. From Galen College, President and Chief Executive Officer Mark A. Vogt. And Catherine M. Mershon, Chair of the Galen Board of Directors. From the Rita and Alex Hillman Foundation, its Executive Director, Aaron Mishan and from the Johnson & Johnson Campaign for Nursing's Future, Laura Kranick, and Linda Benton from the Jones Center for Nursing Excellence, its generous founders, Barbara and Donald Jonas, along with Executive Director Darlene Curley, and William Bester, Senior Advisor, Jonas Veterans Healthcare Program. From longtime friend, Lairdall Medical, we'd like to thank Executive Chairman and CEO Tor Lairdall, COO Alf Christian Dibdahl, and David Johnson, President, Lairdall Americas, and public member of the NLN Board of Governors. From Walters Clore, Kathy Wolf, President and CEO Health Learning, Research, and Practice, and Vice President of Global Publishing, Jane Marks. All the generous supporters of our expanding Advanced Care Excellence for Senior program that we call ACES, from the Hearst Foundation's Program Strategy Manager, Sarah Miseroff, 
from the Independence Foundation of Philadelphia, CEO and President Susan Sherman. From the Retirement Research Foundation in Chicago, Mary O'Donnell, Senior Program Officer, and our named benefactors, Dorothy Odo, and Isabel Hampton Robb Benefactor, Robert Piamonte, and Isabel Stewart Benefactor, and Angela McBride, a Lillian Wald Benefactor. You are precious, thank you. Colleagues, join me in thanking this year's sponsors. Please hold your applause until we have acknowledged them all. This year, we have three diamond sponsors. Laredal Medical, thank you to Laredal for your continuing generosity, and Western Governors University, which is sponsoring this year's President's Gala a reception on Saturday night. Thank you, Jan jones Shank. And finally, our inaugural partner and also this year's Summit Conference app sponsor, Chamberlain University College of Nursing. Thanks so very much, Susan Gronwall. At the platinum level and sponsor of tonight's opening reception, the University of Texas at Arlington, College of Nursing and Health Innovation. Uh, <laughs> Uh, thank you, Dean Ann Bevere, for this most generous gift. <laughs> Supporting us at the gold level is Duquesne University School of Nursing. Thank you, Dean Mary Ellen Glasgow. Our silver sponsors include Walters Clure Health, which is providing our coffee breaks this year, and the George Washington University School of Nursing, which is sponsoring all of tomorrow's concurrent sessions. And thank you to our bronze sponsors, to our lunch sponsors, F.A. Davis on Friday and C.A.E. Healthcare on Saturday. The always engaging national faculty meeting is supported by our good friends at Elsevier. And today's opening session, an inspiring keynote address, is again generously sponsored by PreCheck. Finally, on behalf of the NLN Foundation for Nursing Education and its chair, Cole Edmondson, we extend thanks to all who have contributed to the foundation throughout the year, such as the NLN Foundation Advisory Council, Colleen Conway Welch, Karen Cox, Julie Hilsenbeck, Beverly Malone, Joan Rich, Patrick Robertson, Roy Simpson, Randy Sparks, Mark Voigt, Louise Werner, and then the 2017 NLN Academy class that are quite a few. The 2017th NLN Centers of Excellence, all benefactors of the NLN Foundation Summit, thank you all. And thank you in advance to everyone who will give through the various opportunities here at the summit. And colleagues, I assure you, there will be plenty of opportunities to give. Be sure to join us tonight. This is a really nice example because you can feed yourself and give at the same time. Be, sh be sure to join us tonight at the Old Spaghetti Factory for our Nurses Dine Out fundraiser. This is the, I'm holding the flyer. It's a blue flyer for those who can't see. And it's for Nurses Dining Out fundraiser immediately after the opening reception. Make sure you bring the blue flyer with you. Dun, da, dun, dun, da, dun. Please, and uh, this one is 15% of every, of your bill will be given to the NLN Foundation. So eat a lot of spaghetti. Please join us in thanking all of these sponsors for their generosity and support. As you can see, there are so many people who give their time and their talent to the NLN. But Bev 
and I pause now for the presentation of the first of the 2017 NLN President's Award. The President's Award recognizes leaders in healthcare who are exemplars of the NLN's core values of excellence, integrity, caring, and diversity. Individuals who have dedicated their life's work to advancing the health of the nation and of the global community. It gives me enormous pleasure to introduce Dr. Patricia Thompson, CEO of Sigma Theta Tau International, the Honor Society of Nursing. Dr. Thompson became Sigma Theta Tau's Chief Executive Officer from her position as Associate Dean for Academic Programs at the College of Nursing at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. Her clinical career began as a pediatric staff nurse at Shumpert Medical Center in Shreve Point, Louisiana. In the early 70s, she obtained her BSN from Northwestern State University, also in Louisiana, and from her master's degree from the University of Alabama in Birmingham. In the early 1980s, she returned to the classroom and earned her EDD in higher education administration with a minor in business management from the University of North Texas in Denton. A Sigma Theta Tau member for more than 30 years, Dr. Thompson has served in many volunteer leadership roles including that of president from 1999 to 2001. She is passionate about the Honor Society and believes the organization accomplishes its goals when it sets out to do something, it does. Under her watch, Sigma Theta's tall community of colleagues grew to 134,000 strong. It's a professional organization and has moved boldly to develop nurse leaders throughout the world. There's no more deserving recipient of the NLN President's Award. Pat has a, exemplified the highest levels of scholarship, teaching, and clinical practice in the profession of nursing throughout her long and distinguished career. A role model to many, I am proud to know her and to honor her on behalf of the NLN. Pat, I am honored. Thank you very much, Ann, Bev, also the NLN board. This is truly an honor. I'm very humbled, and this award means so very much to me personally and professionally. As we all know, and we've all accomplished much in this room, accomplishments come from hard work and dedication, but more than that, they come from the support of so many people that help us along our career trajectory. Those people are mentors, colleagues, and friends. And I've been very blessed, and many of those people are in this room this evening. As I look at and think and reflect, because prior to this job, I was a faculty member for a very long time, appreciate that role and what we do, I think we don't always recognize the wonderful influence and the power that we have to move students forward and to also help the profession develop the leaders that we need for the future. And as I reflected on my career, as I'll be retiring in December from this job, but I'm still going to be around. Uh, <laughs> as I reflected on my career, I think I'm a very good example of what we're able to do as faculty members and how we can influence and guide and change career paths for individuals. As an undergraduate student, I had a faculty member who planted the seeds about continuing education and really worked on trying to move me down that path. 
To be honest, my goals at that point were I want to get a job, I want to buy a car, you know, the concrete things, and that was about as far as my future planning went. My parents, neither one of them graduated for college, so I really believed getting a baccalaureate degree was a major accomplishment. If not for that faculty member, I would not have received a doctorate at age 32. I had another faculty member who really pushed and helped me better understand how important professional associations are for you as an individual student and nurse, as well as for the profession and what we can do together. And because of that faculty member's mentoring, my first what I would call significant leadership position was as president of Louisiana Association of Student Nurses. From there, I advanced and over time became very involved in, over a long period of my career, with Sigma Theta Tau International. So tonight, I accept this wonderful honor on behalf of all of those who have supported me across my career, but also an appreciation of each and every one of us in this room who have in the past and who will in the future continue to mentor those students and new graduates. Thank you so very much. Congratulations, Pat. As you enter a new phase of your life, please carry our love for you with you. It is now my pleasure and Anne's pleasure, too, to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. David Daniels. As I describe his work, you'll see how he epitomizes the summit's theme, community of colleagues. Dr. Daniel is an award-winning teacher with over 25 years of classroom experience. He is a highly sought after international speaker and scholar focused on developing evidence, demonstrated usable knowledge for educational practice and policy. A fellow of the Association for Psychological Science, David has been honored numerous times for his teaching and translational efforts. He was recently appointed to a select panel of the National Academy of Sciences to update and extend the influential National Research Council report, How People Learn, Brain, Mind, Experience, and School. David is a teacher's teacher. His recent honors include the Society for the Teaching of Psychology's Teaching Excellence Award and being recognized as one of the top 1% of educational researchers influencing public debate. His work focuses on translating scientific findings to usable knowledge, particularly for educational practice, policy, and student learning. He especially enjoys working collaboratively as a community of colleagues with students and other faculty to translate evidence-based strategies and sustainable teaching and learning practice across disciplines. In recent years, Dr. Daniel has taken a special interest in our work as educators. Today, he will discuss the science of learning, offer steps for responsible and high impact translation and generate implications for us as we strive to bring excellence to nursing education to advance the health of the nation and the global community. Colleagues, please join me in welcoming Dr. Daniel as he presents Teaching is Science, Translating the Science of Learning for Nurse Educators. Hey, thanks for that. That's my whole webpage, I think. <laughs> hey, but before we get going, um, this is 15% off the whole bill? That includes drinks? Nice. Someone's getting some philanthropy tonight. <laughs> How are you guys? You've just been clapping for like a half hour. 
and I'm here to stop that. <laughs> Hold on, let's get rid of all the internets they want me to be on. All right. Um, my job is, I started as uh, is, is a teacher, all right? People call me a learning scientist. I was a neuroscientist. They call me all these scientist things. But I came at this really, really differently. I came at it from a teacher's perspective. And working with you is really interesting for me because my wife's a nurse, a pediatric nurse. Um, I've worked with nurse educators most of my career at the schools I've worked at, nursing students because I teach general psych and child development. Um, but very rarely has anybody really um, tried to incorporate me at the professional level until Anna Lynn came and talked to me last year. And it's awesome. Um, and I had put together a really nice talk for you, and then I sat down last night in my room and I thought about it, and I don't like it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and since we're running a little bit late anyway, this is going to be fun. Um, but I can't see you all, but if you have a question while I'm talking, just go ahead and ask it like a real classroom. All right. Um, first off, I did a literature review. What I wanted to find out in the field of nursing was what has the literature shown works in the nursing classroom? And I've made a, li a partial list of everything I found that works. <laughs> then I did the opposite. I tried to find a list of things that have been shown not to work in the nursing classroom. <laughs> it's the same damn list. <laughs> and I love the fact that you're going to a spaghetti restaurant tonight because that's a great metaphor for teaching. It's messy. Right? Teaching's messy, and a lot of this stuff is done in controlled environments. Um, and so that's what I want to talk about at first, is, is the controlled environment aspect of all this. In the science of learning, which is very popular now, there's books out everywhere, there's, you know, everybody's talking, have you heard about it? Okay, uh, making it stick, all these books about that. There's only four findings everybody's talking about, okay? Um, I come from, I started to help start the journal Mind Brain Education, so we came from a neuroscience cognitive point of view. Um, and I, if you do a review of what is out there that could help educators, there's a lot out there, okay? Um, well, there's a lot that helps people. For nurse educators, some of that might work. We don't know, okay? How much of it has been designed for you to use in your classroom? <laughs> All right? It, it, it's, it's out there, but it's not been shown to work in most classrooms. That's a problem if you're calling yourself an evidence-based teacher, right? Okay, what does evidence-based mean? So that's what we're gonna look into for a little bit, then I'm gonna go off on some new stuff. Um, one of the reasons why scientists can't get to the classroom so easily is think about the nature of science, okay? Scientists break the, the learner down into little parts, right? and then we study those parts. You have cognitive, you have motivational, you have emotional, a bunch of other ones, biological, and then we're going to study parts of those, like attention or maybe memory or those. And we're going to go further and further and further, smaller and more and more granular. Person in our classroom is all those things working all the time. Does that make sense? Okay, that makes it really hard to go from these little pieces um, into what, how to affect this person effectively because all these things are working simultaneously in that person, and that becomes an issue. Okay, the other thing is, is scientists cherry pick their variables. Right? We pick things that are interesting, um, that are theoretical. We definitely like where the grants are. Okay, we're like terrorists. Follow the money, you'll find a scientist. Um, <laughs> who in the back would, oh, that? It gets worse. I like Louis C.K. too. So, um, <laughs> but think about it. It's nobody's job to put that student back together. Right? And there's all this stuff we didn't study, too, all that dark matter that we're not studying. Right? And you know if you put something back together without knowing a whole lot about it, bad things can happen. <laughs> right? And then you get in trouble, just stuff. Right? Um, and so that's our job. So there's nobody in science doing that for educators. Okay, now I'm going to show you how this impacted my, my real life. Um, I was at a teaching conference. And uh, there was a, a guy at a lectern, and he was wearing camel hair, too. I wore this in homage to him. <laughs> Not a great move for San Diego, by the way. <laughs> um, but he stood up, and I'll, I'll, I'll do what he did to you. Okay, How many of you tell your students to read before coming to class? Raise your hand. 
How many think that's a good idea? Raise your hand. You're all wrong. I have data. That was his opening, right? And I'm sitting there. That was a wonderful rap, by the way. I was sitting there like the little mean rappers the whole time with the talk, really, the whole time. Okay, just staring him down. Like, my experience as a teacher was if they read before class, I get a little further, I can go a little deeper, I could do little stuff. He was saying it's wrong. So he showed the data, okay? Now, the data, oops, my X and Y um, are black. I changed it to black when I saw the room, <laughs> sorry. Um, but the data showed that in his, his, his study, the reading before class, if, if English is your first language, actually did less well on the outcome test than if they read after the test. After, after the lecture, excuse me. That was interesting to me, but I didn't like him. <laughs> <laughs> and what I do, what I, what I don't like people is I actually engage with them, because, it, you know, um, no. Um, I walked up to him, I said, hey, let's do a study in real life. Let's adapt this to the classroom, all right? And we did that. What was interesting about this, think about this, if I would have just listened to this at the teaching conference and went home, I would have changed my whole thing, all right? But when we did it in the classroom, almost to the number, the opposite results. All right? If I had taken his, his um, data from the lab and used it in my classroom, I would have been hurting my students. All right? This blew me away. All right? I, I didn't want to change my teaching. I, I just wanted to do a vengeance-based research project. Um, and then, by the way, those of you who teach a lot, you know this. I asked my students, why, you know, what did, I always focus group after a quantitative study, and they said they really only read the parts I talked about, thinking that way we'd be on the test. <laughs> right? So that's where it came from. Right? But that really messed me up, because now what evidence can I rely upon? If I go to, the, if I go to the, 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 the best researchers, what evidence can I rely upon? The problem is teachers and researchers are talking about the same thing, but not to each other. And when that happens, there's a problem. By the way, that's a real picture. I got it off the internet. So. <laughs> Cause water's that blue. <laughs> All right. Um, so we need a better model for this, and this is the model I actually shared with um, uh, nurse nurse education researchers. Um, and I really wanted to ask about what models do we have for that. Because in my experience, the nurse educators are really, the, of all the people I work with in psychology and math, uh, the nurse educators are actually on the cutting edge of most of this stuff. They're doing stimulation. They, they were the first to go online and get actually good results. Um, they do some really, really neat things. We never hear about it, right? But you clap for each other, so that's good. <laughs> right? um, but what's the model that we could actually use, or I could promote, to make this, uh, this community actually work together? Right? So I was thinking medicine. Uh, let's look at the drug, the drug approval process as, as, as a metaphor. Okay. So those of you familiar with the drug approval process, um, a, a chemist might find a, a reaction to Petri dish they really, really like. Um, they'll make a compound out of it. They'll maybe try it on some rats. Right? Then they move it on to another group of people. Their job is to translate that into something potentially usable, make a treatment, make a pill, whatever it is, do the trials, look for interactions, look for side effects, proper applications. You all familiar with this? You want me to slow down? We're good? Okay. Um, but that's a whole other specialty, right? Okay. And their job is to move it from the chemist toward real life and look at cost benefits and see do the benefits outweigh the costs and then move it forward if they can, market that, and um, get it to the doctor. And more of this is actually going straight to patient now, right? Now you're seeing some of these, these treatments go straight to the patient. What do we have in education? Okay, we have some stuff. Pro promising principle may come from a lab. For example, space out your learning over time. Um, we uh, don't use rats, we'll use freshmen. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's where it used to be, right? You do it on some class, it shows that it works, it's all good. All right? But then we started actually going into classrooms, the researchers who weren't, never, you know, very rarely teach this stuff. We were going to ask the teacher, can I have your classroom? Can I do a semester? Can I work, on, work with your students? And I, I call that, well, it's P2 on here, but what it is, it's actually, get that going here. Oh, the internet came back up. Sorry. Okay. I call that a hothouse experiment. All right, because think about it. I want control of your environment so I can see if this flower can grow. All right, is that realistic? It's more real than the Petri dish or the freshman, 
right? But is it enough for me to be able to say, go forward with this, everybody, it's going to work? Is it really an evidence-demonstrated practice? All right? Where is the people who, do, who make the pill, who figure out what are the interactions, what are the side effects, what are the proper applications? What about the emotional part? Should there be some cognitively in inert ingredients so they can actually get excited about this? All right? Those sorts of things. Okay? This is being done by science writers, authors, um, these new things called thought leaders. Have you heard of that? So I was at a conference, a guy came up to me with a card, he was like, oh, I like your stuff, I'm a thought leader. Follow me. No, um, but <laughs> I don't know what they do, but he had really great shoes, so they must make more money than me. <laughs> but for us, it's being done by teachers. We hear stuff, we read stuff, we think of stuff, and we try to see if it works in the context very, very similarly, all right? Um, but these books make a compelling argument. It starts a little fad sometimes. They market all these ideas. The science of learning is, is very well marketed online. Um, and then let's go to the teacher or student. Okay. Is that the process that you want? Do you want medicine or do you want supplements? All right. Supplements have a compelling argument, sometimes good marketing, and a lot of testimonials from teachers and students. All right. But do we know if they work like medicine's supposed to? Okay. So these guys are preaching all the time, mostly for themselves. <laughs> and again, better shoes than me. So. I just really want to think about this, all right? We have all these things out for us to read as teachers. We're, we're a target market, all right? But evidence-based is an argument. The brain does this. This one little part of the brain does this. Therefore, you should teach. That's a big leap, right? So evidence-based is really a deduction or an induct it's an argument, okay? What I want is evidence demonstrated. I want someone who's done it in a context similar to when I teach and shown that it works in stuff that I got to teach. Does that make sense to you? Okay. Um, it's really hard to find, isn't it? Okay. Um, so that means the, per, the, the translation, the design, who's contextualizing this. I do a lot of work with tribal colleges, um, you know, uh, different kinds of uh, contexts have different kinds of demands. Um, if you're teaching a, a course like, like micro, you're going to have a whole different set of cognitive demands than if you're teaching a, a class that involves simulations and some other sorts of things. No one's doing that for us in a systematic way that we can rely upon. That means we're awesome, right? That whole skill set that we weren't trained in is now something that is our domain because no one else has bothered to pick it up. If you think about the good teachers around here, and I don't know if you're one, if not, look to, look to your left or right. Um, <laughs> they're doing this all the time, right? They're doing this all the time, all right? Psychology gave up on us. All right? That was a long time ago. But that inventive mind, that intermediate inventive mind that William James talked about, that's where the psychology and cognitive science and learning science still is. It's relying upon teachers to figure out how to make this work. Right? And that's, that's a good thing um, in, in a long ways because I don't want people who don't know what I'm doing to tell me what to do. All right? Okay. So, I, there's a whole bunch of steps to this. I just pulled out a couple, okay? The key to this, in my opinion, is making the pill, okay? It's design. So I'm only gonna talk about design today, but we could talk about anything else when, when the questions come up, all right? How do you design, like, what, what, what are some things you think about when you're designing an intervention? All right? now, I'm not gonna go through all the steps because different interventions require different steps. But the one thing that, there, that we weren't trained in is designing the intervention for our students and reflecting about did it work or not. And that's an ethic we have to have in a world where there's more and more pressure on us to actually do our jobs, all right? Um, and, and I want, especially in nursing, by the way, uh, some of you are at schools where you know where your students are passing but they're not passing the boards, right? There, there's, there's lots of different layers in nursing about what is learning and what is not learning and what do we rely upon, what do we do that? How do we align all that stuff to give the students the best they can? Because their job actually, when they make a mistake, bad things can happen. When I make a mistake, what do I get? No, I get tenure. <laughs> right? It's pretty fun, to be honest with you. I just get this. Well, not that finger, but there's another one that Dean likes. <laughs> it's, it's this one. Okay. Um, so think about this. This is off of the NASA website as an analogy. Okay? This is made by engineers. Okay. 
This is a cockpit for a, a flight, uh, for an airplane. Okay. They took this cockpit, they gave it to pilots in a simulator, and this is my favorite term, I think, in the world for, for right now. It had an unacceptable crash rate. Okay. That means there's an acceptable crash rate. <laughs> I just love writing these talks. Um, you just learn stuff. So anyway, they kept going to the engineers saying, look, they're crashing it. And the engineers are, are like, well, make them study the manual more. Make them study the manual more. They're just stupid. Get smarter pilots. What are your admission standards? Da, 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 da. All right? And too much money had gone into this, and it wasn't working. Rewriting the manual, putting it online, da, 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 da. And someone said, why don't we design the cockpit for people, not engineers? <laughs> All right? So they gave it to someone who does human factors, basically who knows about how people think, how they perceive. They reconstructed the, the um, cockpit to look like this. Oh, internet's back on. Sorry, guys. And now people are flying this airplane because it now has an acceptable crash rate. <laughs> the people who did it weren't skilled nor cognizant of the fact that there are people who have to use this. They made it. They knew it. They didn't have to think about how people who didn't know it from the, from the bottom up would deal with it. Teachers have to think about that, too. All right? Remember, we're talking about a whole person with all these things going on at the same time. And we can kill one of these while upping the other one, right? Okay? So what we're talking about are side effects. If you're coming from medicine, there's huge, like, reams of, of books and articles about side effects. Right? One of my favorite books is actually by Susan Mollum. It's called The Best of Intentions. And she um, goes through the history of, of, of medicine, looking at some of the, the, the mistakes people have made. Um, one was in New Zealand. Native children were dying of iron deficiency, very high rates. Okay? The, um, they would live in huts, you know, dirt, dirt floor huts, um, and uh, they wanted to help them out. They started dying at high rates. Um, it turned out iron deficiency. What do you do when people have an iron deficiency? Give them iron. Some of you didn't want to say that. What else would you do then? Red bag. You give them iron. So they gave them iron. They gave them high doses of iron. Iron deficiency went way down. Unfortunately, the death rate went way up because iron feeds bacteria. And they were living in a dirty environment. By not thinking about where this was going to be applied, they actually made the problem worse. You see the analogy to education there? All right. So really what I want to talk about, I'll skip ahead of here. I think that pedagogy should come with a warning. I made that. Um, I added intellectual death. But think about that, all right? Everything works on something or it wouldn't be in the literature, but what is, does it have side effects? We don't test for side effects in education. We test for our dependent variables, all right? For example, you're told drill and kill is bad nowadays you're in, because everybody's into active learning, okay? Drilling for math facts, for example, works. Read the literature. Drilling works. If your dependent variable is learning math, it works. Your dependent variable is sucking the soul from the learner, it also works. <laughs> okay. But if you don't add that into your study, you're fine. <laughs> right? Because we're talking about interactions here. The two have to go together. All right? Another interaction is we see students who aren't doing well, and we, for example, our students can't read. They don't like to read anymore. Just reading is disgusting. Oh, gross. Right? It's like math we used to be. People are afraid of reading now. All right? And I put this in just as an example of, a, of a, actually a judgment. Okay? If I go more active, if I go more guided, if I flip my classroom because they're not able now to read and develop usable knowledge from reading, am I helping them or hurting them? Depends on what, what you're measuring. For your class, I'm helping them. Right? If they got to read ever again, it didn't work out so well. All right? So I can mask its efficiency to get my learning outcome, but am I cultivating a good learner, someone who's going to be able to go into the field? And if you're going into nursing, if you're going into to medicine, you're going to have to be a lifelong learner. And maybe reading, good idea. <laughs> right. 
So when we're thinking about interventions, um, it's important to think about are we actually making our, their life better for now but making it harder in the future? And that's just a judgment call, all right? I get, thought leader is what he wanted to talk to me about. He didn't think that we needed to learn anything anymore because you could Google it. You've heard that, that argument, right? They don't need to memorize anything because they can Google it. Well, he, he had a whole thing where school districts should just change everything they do because Google exists. Right? Now, in Florida, they would all like, there's no power now. What would they do? All right, another thing that we tend to do is overdose the student with too much stuff. There's a certain point where you give so much thing, so many things to the students, they can't do their job anymore. Now, they may be an ass, but... <laughs> sorry, I had to do it. It was just sitting right there. <laughs> sorry. Um, but you want them doing their job, all right? And think about how this works, for example, when we give them three or four different online modules from different publishers, or something we develop and other people develop, or just across their curriculum where three or four teachers have three or four different sorts of online resources, and the students have to try so hard to learn how to navigate, the learning of the actual objective doesn't happen. Okay? As we're going toward online, even some of the simulations that, aren't, that you have to get used to before you do them, we have to think about that. Are we diverting their learning resources to something else? And that's a design issue. We don't have to design it that way, but we have to not overload them. Okay? And then most of these things assume the student's motivated to learn. Okay? I don't know what you see when you go to your classroom on Monday. This is what I will see. I'm not, not at all. <laughs> is that who your students are most of the time? Is this better? <laughs> <laughs> I like that one in the corner, because not only does she hate me, she wants to kill herself just for showing up to class. <laughs> I, I tried to find a nurse one. This is all I could find. <laughs> You're not well represented on the internet. Just want you to know that. <laughs> but you look highly motivated. <laughs> um, actually, I want to throw this out at you, by the way. Um, I don't know. There's a couple deans here. I want you, I want you to think about this. Um, students have to have, well, I'll get to it in a second. Um, students have to have priorities. Now, before, nursing students are different than other students. They're more like pre-med in a lot of ways, especially if you're in a high in a, a school with, with a lot of competition, because they, they're trying to get into your college, and, they, and there's, there's competition. Other, other places, not so much. But student priorities, when they're, when they're not forced from the outside, this is from instructional technology, learning's not their top priority most of the time. Getting a grade might be. But they're, they're just like us. Actually, I, 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 this might be controversial, but they're human. Don't, don't boo me, that guy. Um, <laughs> but they want to be efficient, just like we do. All right? And if you look at this, convenience is number one, followed by save me time and help me manage my class activities, which are other measures of efficiency. Okay? Learning is third from last. It's just above nothing. Now, I always tell my students, it's not my job to motivate you. It's my job not to punish you for being motivated. Okay? But I can't come in there and, and, and motivate everybody. But motivations actually follows their priorities. All right? um, we have to align those priorities. There's also a concept called affordances. I have a whole talk on this, but, and I threw this in at the very last minute. But when we design something, it can do what we want it to do. But it might do other things, too, depending on the goal. For example, if someone has a laptop or a pad, iPad in the class, it could do a lot of cool stuff. If your goal is learning, if you're motivated to learn, that can do some cool stuff. If your goal is to stay popular with your friends, it can do a lot of cool stuff. I have students in there who are Snapchatting, you know, like, just like, the, oh, his, his, his hair's not good today. <laughs> You're a snap. Um, I got boomeranged once. I don't know what that was, but it never came back. Um, but there's... You let these things happen in the class for pedagogical reasons, but if their goal isn't learning, these can be a huge detour from learning. Okay? So everything you do, everything you do pedagogically has a potential dark side if their goal is not aligned with your goal. And when you design it, you have to keep that in mind. What a real actual... Where's Pat? There you are. You're from Denton? You, you went there, though, right? 
Yeah. I had a job, um, a job interview there. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what happened. <laughs> Speaking of affordances, th there was a flood in the room I was supposed to give my job top in, so they moved it to another room that was full of computers. And I'm talking about pedagogy and how students have certain goals and like that. And I have all these professors who are really nice people, but they're in front of computers. And one by one, they start to break out like meth addicts. <laughs> like, just looking at the computer, trying not to reach for the mouse. <laughs> and one by one, they all kind of started surreptitiously trying to check their email. <laughs> right? So I used, waited for my talk, and I called them on I said, if you can't not do it, what about your students? They've been doing it since they were four. I thought that was an awesome teachable moment. That's why I didn't get the job. <laughs> Because they were in the lab for one reason. I was there for one reason, but they had a different goal in mind. Okay? Um, so what's in front of you? Pay attention. It could be important. Yeah. It's, it's nice to look cool, but maybe just turn around once in a while. Also, that's really bad Photoshop. You see there's no wing on that side? <laughs> Right, so design it for the actual students in front of you. I think that's a really important part of translation, is how they're really going to use it. Um, that's my preamble. So let's get to some of the, teach, the, the, the science of learning findings. Okay? There's really only four that are out there. This is the, the review of all the science of learning findings that was done a while back. And if you look at it, practice quizzing, um, practice testing, which is not practice quizzing. We could talk about that if you want to with questions. Um, distributed practice, which is spacing things out over time. I'm going to define all these for a second. Interleaving, which is a combination of the two a little bit. And then self-explanation. Okay, those are the four that everybody's been talking about. These are over 103 years old in the literature. None of these are new. Okay, they were found out by Ebbinghaus mostly a long, long time ago. Okay, but he didn't have good marketing. Highlighting and rereading were shown to have negative effects on, on learning. Highlighting. Um, so let's look at that. Okay. Is rereading a good strategy? Okay. Um, it, af, af, think about this. If you, if you were putting money into a, into a vending machine, let's, let's pretend that Cokes were a dollar at, at some place. <laughs> and you put a dollar in, no Coke. Put a dollar in, no Coke. Good. I'll put another dollar in, no Coke. How many dollars are you going to put in until you realize no Coke? That's what our student was still I read this eight times. I still don't get it. Well, duh, no Coke. <laughs> All right. Don't do the same thing wrong eight times. Do it three times just to make sure it was really wrong. But rereading, if you're doing the same thing over and over, you're not going to get it. You've got to read differently. You've got to read and explain it to you. Read a section. Say it back. I tell my friends, find a moron. They're easy to find, by the way. Um, <laughs> and explain the sections to them, your roommate or whatever. But just you know, think more deeply about what you're reading. Read differently, not again. That's why rereading doesn't work. Is because it just and you know, students don't read. Like when I say to my students, read chapter one. Okay, what I mean is learn chapter one. What they hear is finish chapter one, right? So it's almost a skim read, isn't it? Okay. Students tend to read in two in, in, in two waves. One is the skim read, especially if there's a quiz involved, and then, then there's a hunt and, hunt, hunting and gathering around the test, right? They hardly ever get the narrative part of it. They're looking for definitions all the time. They're breaking it down. Um, so we have to slow them down and get them to think dip, differently about it. Okay. And if you do that self-explanation when you're reading, you actually do get two bags of chips. It's actually very productive. It's less time, more of a benefit. Okay? Another one is cramming. All right. Cramming, you can write this down if you want. Cramming works. All right? Whoever tells you cramming doesn't work, they're wrong. Literature is very clear. Cramming works for short-term retention. All right? If my goal is to know it, maybe tomorrow, cramming completely works. Okay? The problem is, think about this. They say, that they say to drink eight glasses of, of, of water a day. Right? What if you did drink it all at once? Right? That's the same thing as cramming. Think about it. It's, you're going to spill a lot of it. Um, 
it's not going to be metabolized. You're going to be thirsty really, really soon again. Right? There's all these really nice analogies to learning. If you put it all in there, it's not going to stay. It, it, it's not going to be metabolized right. You're going to need more water soon. All right? So instead of cramming and doing it all at once, if your goal is to, for example, I always have a cumulative midterm and a cumulative final. There's cumulative part of everything. All right? In nursing, unless you really don't like what you teach, you don't think it's useful in the world, you should do cumulative stuff, even over the course of your program. Because if they don't revisit it a few times, they've just done this. All right? What I want is for them to actually, this internet thing's getting on me. They're persistent, they want their five bucks. Five, 12.95, sorry. The thing is, is, is we, we know that learning wise, if you distribute it, that same amount of time, that same amount of water over time, you get a much better effect. It gets to sink in. It gets to be metabolized. You get to, you get to, you get to process it. You get to work with it. And just about when you're ready to forget, Drink again. Before you even get thirsty, when it's thirst starts to come on, that's when you, when you space it out to. All right? And this is all what distributed practice is. And I don't know if you've heard about it. Okay? There's different ways to design this for your classroom. And I don't know your classroom, so I'm not going to tell you how to do it. But your goal is to revisit it, not necessarily higher levels, if it's, if it's specific to memorizing, is just to revisit it so, like booster shots. Okay? And I'll, I'll have a little thing for that in a second. In medical education, I love this study. You'll, you'll know why, because you're going you're to sense of my, my, my humor. They took sur uh, junior surgical residents, taught them a procedure. Okay? 19 of them got mass practice, which means four sessions in one day. That's important for junior residents, because that's how they get to go golfing when they're a doctor. <laughs> they sign up for classes, they do this in the morning, and they go golf. Okay? Um, 19 got space practice, one session a week over four weeks. Same amount of time. One got it one Saturday, the other one's got it four different Saturdays. Are we clear on that? Okay, nice little study. Okay, they did a whole bunch of different sorts of things. Pre-test, immediate post-test, one month post-test. They had expert evaluations, computer-based evaluations, and a tra transfer test on actual rats to see if they could do the procedure. Okay, here's what they found. Cramming works. At, okay, excuse me, the pre-test, post-test, no difference. Cramming works. Okay, at the end, at the end of the thing, they, they were all at the same point. What about a month out? Okay, month out, space practice, knew the stuff better on the tests. That's fine. Okay, that's good for school. What about working on rats? What about doing the actual surgery on live creatures and seeing if you kill them or not? Okay, not so good for mass practice. All right, um, on the on the live procedure. In all, in all the expert-based measures, um, they were much lower and killed significantly more rats. Zero for space and a whole bunch for the other group. Okay? This is the same material. It's the same everything, just spaced out differently. Okay? Because we never think about time. We're thinking about efficiency, too. Okay? Schools are thinking about efficiency. How do we get this all done in a four-week May term? Or how do we get this done, da-da-da-da, all right? We need time to learn. It's biological work, okay? Um, and you, you, the analogy really is for booster shots. The booster shots actually happen as the, as the antigens are starting to kind of go out of the system. We do a booster shot and pop it up. The same thing with distributed practice. Right about when it's starting to fade, pop it up. Eventually, the system keeps it there, and you don't need the booster shots all the time. The other one is retrieval practice, and if, if you want me to go more into this, I will, but it's a very simple thing. The researchers basically found something that I think you'll know already. If you show a person all the questions on a test four or five times before the test, they do really well on the test. <laughs> That's what the testing effect is, ladies and gentlemen, by their books. Okay? As a teacher, I call that cheating. Okay. Um, but they're starting to find now, if you, if you write questions a certain way, you can actually get it for non-identical sorts of um, questions. Um, but what, the principle is really simple. Okay? Think about like a trail through the woods. First couple times, you, you, you go over here, you go over here, you go over here. Eventually, you find the most efficient way, and then you, as you, you go, walk back and forth, you make an efficient trail. You can always go back and find where you want to go after that. Okay? So retrieval practice is nothing but trying to go back and retrieve the information you need when you need it and practicing that so when you need it, you go back and do it. Does that make sense? Okay. Nursing teachers already know that, don't you? 
Okay, a lot of, a lot of your curriculum is based on that. The question is, how, uh, how often do you have them retrieve it, and then you have them stop it in the semester, do they ever go back and do it again until they're in practice? Okay. Internet again. So that leads me to time, okay? Um, contrary to what my students tell me, time is not the same as effort. I, have to do, I spent 12 hours studying for your test. I deserve a better grade. <laughs> really? Wow. That was dumb. <laughs> Think about what you just told me. Do, do you really want the, the, the doctor that was in medical school the longest doing your research? <laughs> I want the one that actually learned the stuff, okay? Um, time is actually, um, some, distributed practice, all this stuff, is, the core part is time. And it goes along with busy work. Students will, like, I don't know if you can tell from looking at me, but I work out about seven hours a day every day. <laughs> That's body shaming. Um, <laughs> I do, but they're, 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 they're one pound weights, and I work them slow so I don't have to actually sweat, okay? That's what my students do. They call it studying. All right. What I want for my students is interval training. High intensity, high impact studying. Then I need you to rest. I need you to come back at it again in a little while after you've come back down and rested. All right. The shallow work keep you going all day long. You don't learn a damn thing. Okay. Um, so let me give you an example of this. Let's say you want to get this picture on your computer. All right, how would you do that? Well, you can Google it. Scan it. Scan it. Let's go for scanner, because that's the one I actually put together. All right, so let's say you want to scan this picture, OK? Put it on your computer. You can use it on a scanner. Now, I, I didn't realize this, but not a lot of my students don't know what these are anymore. <laughs> what the? F I just bought one like a year ago. But they're just taking pictures with their phone which is highly degrading, because <laughs> I'm old. Um, so you have a scanner, and this is, this is why this is kind of a neat analogy if they were old enough to get it. All right, The scanner you can set at different resolutions. Okay. The lower the resolution, the faster the work. Right? So I set it for 50. I, I, get a, I get my picture scanned really, really fast. Okay? And the, and the um, scanner doesn't make a lot of noise for very long. It's nice. Okay? It's all good. Okay? So I get a picture on my computer. It's nice, all right? But if I were to take that scanner and change the resolution from 50 to 300, what would I get? I get a picture I can use anytime I want, and that's just not that second, right? What if that first picture was for email, now I need one for my PowerPoint? Okay, the resolution is going to be terrible. I got to redo it again. I got to restudy. I got to reread. I got to redo it, all right? If I did it right the first time, I'd have a picture I could use for anything I want, and it, and it would last for a while. Okay? It's more work. It take, it, it, the, 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 the scanner's going to make a whole lot more noise, but the product is easier to use for everything and it transfers better. Is that a good analogy? Okay. That's what I want my students to do. I want them picking 300 when it's appropriate and then doing the work and then they're done. They, they could go back there. Okay. The key thing there is the students are in charge of that. We can't make them do that work. We can set up this, you know, sometimes when, I, when, I, when I'm driving, I just think that all we really do is, is encourage people to do the work of learning and structure it. They've got to do it themselves. You know, that's the real art is, is inspiring them to do the work. Okay? Let's, a little bit, I don't, it's not a neuroscience talk, but let's look at a little, little bit of neuroscience. All right? There's this thing in the brain called the default mode. The def when they put people in an fMRI, they're still thinking even when they're not being tested. They're laying there, right? Well, turn the fMRI on, look at their stuff. The brain's active when you're doing nothing because you're never doing nothing, right? So what's the brain doing when it's doing nothing? It's creating all those networks from all that input you've had earlier that day. It's situating it with, with, your, pr uh, with your prior knowledge and making meaning. It's doing a lot of stuff when it's doing nothing. Constantly being bombarded with stimuli doesn't give your brain time for that rest Okay. Distributed practice leverages this. Off-task time is actually on-task time because we have to have time to make the knowledge, not just get it into the system. All right? So our students need time to actually create knowledge, get a lot of input. That's what the interval training is. Work out, rest, situate it. Okay? OK? 
okay? Because we have to understand it's biological work. We have to actually make networks and then reinforce those networks and make them available, almost automatic if we can, depending on what, what the goal is. Like when you were learning how to drive, it was really, really hard. Now you can text and do all that other stuff while you're driving. <laughs> okay. You've made efficient networks. That took time. Okay. So one thing I wanted to throw out there, this is what I started earlier, is you've all heard, of, a lot of you heard about growth mindset. I'm not gonna go into it, it's a whole talk. But I teach general psychology and child development, like I said. I have your students before they're in the nursing programs. And some nursing programs, you have to have a really, really high GPA and almost perfect to get in, right? Okay. Don't do that anymore. I want, to, I want you to, I, I'm just, this, is, this is political, because I get these students and all they care about is their grade. They don't take risks. They won't make mistakes. They won't be creative. They worry about misapplying things. And I don't want that in a nurse. Well, maybe they're not taking huge risks part. Um, <laughs> but that woman in Utah, she got arrested. She was right. Okay. Yeah. Give your students the chance and encourage them to make constructive mistakes, not random mistakes, all right? Because when you're building circuits, when you're building ways through the woods, whatever you want to say, you're going to take some wrong paths, and that's, when you know, that's how you know the right one. You learn more from your mistakes than you do from your successes. You don't review your successes as much as you do your mistakes, right? Encourage them to make the right kind of mistakes. Have them come back around to it instead, instead of fail. Um, I, I want to see a, a person who, if, if there's not a right way, they'll stop and figure out the right way rather than quit because they want to be perfect or nothing, okay? That's the key to a growth mindset is someone who actually attacks a problem um, knowing that it can fail, but they're going to come back and keep at it until they get it right, and they're going to learn from their mistakes. So I just wanted to th just threw that slide in there this afternoon, okay? So focus attention and effort on the learning goals. I want the students do that, but I also want us to do that. A lot of us uh, have a hard time with actually what's the learning objective for this lesson or for this day, okay? What do I want them to know? I want to focus the attention on that. I want them to do the work. I want them to work hard, uh, not long, hard. Um, evaluate if they've been successful, and then do it again better. That's really simple, right? Okay? That last part, we hardly ever give people a chance to do. Well, actually, the last two. All right? And there's really strong learning science that, 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 that could be part of things. You work harder at something, you get better. You get better, your brain works less. You become efficient. But they've got to go through the work harder, get better, before they get better, work less. Okay, if your goal is efficiency, you have to go through inefficiency to get there. Okay, to close up, best practices, I, I know we, we've heard that term uh, sometimes, I don't believe in best practices. You have to figure out what works for you in your classroom with your students. No one can tell you that. Okay, um, oh, thanks. I really believe that teaching is personally empirical. I mean, there could be promising principles, all right? I just shared with you some very promising principles. Right? But those principles have to be adapted to your context and to you. By the way, I remember I told you students were human. Another controversial thing, so are you. <laughs> right? And legislatures, sometimes administrations, don't understand that the students are human beings. We all have a style. We all have things we're good at, we're bad at. We all have moods sometimes. Okay? We're, a, we're actually, have, we, but being humans, what we, you know, there's never been a study done where the, where the computer beats a good teacher. Okay? Because we can adapt in the moment in a way machine learning can't do that. All right? We're at, good teachers are worth their weight in gold. That's why I've been gaining so much weight. <laughs> okay. um, but a promising principle isn't good pedagogy until it works for you. So you have to be ex a, an explorer. You have to be that translator. It's, it's, it's gonna, you're going to get great ideas from lots of the different places during, this, during this, uh, this meeting. You still have to go out and see if it works. Okay? It's like jeans. You, I can, you can't buy them off the rack, ladies. You, my, my wife taught me that. I just, I just, I, there's my size, go buy them. She says, you can't do that. I can't do that. I said, what do you mean? I go, you buy these jeans. No, you got to try them on. Oh, you never know how they're going to fit. You know, all women are different. Da, 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 right? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but it's a great analogy for pedagogy. You got to try that stuff on. All right? And you got to walk around in it. Okay? You, you got to leave, leave the dressing room. You got to teach in it and see if it works for you. Okay? Best practices exist only for the people who are exactly like you. There's not going to be a lot of them. Internet again.
Okay, so if what we do is practical, it's not theoretical, if what we do is we have to make real gains in real people in real time, all right, that's a lot of responsibility on a good teacher. All right, especially with emerging science and emerging students and all the different demographics we're dealing with. All right, you'll get hypotheses, go try them and gather some sort of data that's important to you. It doesn't have to be formal publishable data, but data that's important to you. Did it accomplish what I thought it was going to accomplish? Okay. Science isn't going to do the work for us. They haven't, they haven't even figured out a system to do it. I, I met with NSF twice in the last year um, trying to figure out what model would work best for education, um, higher education in particular, um, because they, we don't have one and they don't fund it. All right? And don't think that you're going to learn teaching from a book. All right? Too many teachers I know buy a book and think, oh, this is how you teach. And they, they like, or, or, like wh what do you do when this happens? Tell me what to do. Well, you're your expert. I'm not your expert. You know you, I don't know you. Do this, it'd be funny to watch, but it won't work. <laughs> Think about that. Think about the, 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 the art part that William James was talking about. It's not an art, it's hard. And science doesn't do hard very well. It doesn't do complexity very well. We do complexity every day, we're at work. All right, and that's a really a noble pursuit, all right? But what if what you do doesn't work? What if that book you read, and you think about it. You go, you get excited at something, you go, you try it, and it doesn't work in your classroom. I'm going to turn that off. You guys can't get over it. <laughs> Hold on. There. <laughs> Damn it, I want to be the center of attention. <laughs> My point was... What if the thing you got excited about and tried, the thing in that book, doesn't work? A good cook could go to, the, to go to the kitchen, go to the cabinets, and whatever's there, make something that'll work. A bad cook got to find a box somewhere, right? And if that box doesn't work, nobody eats that day, right? A good teacher, every day, they're going to eat, all right? You're going to figure it out, all right? What you need are the ingredients, right? So think about the old apothecaries, all right? What that pharmacist had to do was, was actually create the medicine right there in front of the person for what they said was wrong. Okay? That's your job. Your job is to know all these ingredients. Know what science has to say. Know what other teachers have to say. Know what's been done that works. Get good educated guests about, guests, guesses about what wouldn't work in your classroom. Master the ingredients. And then a good teacher will figure out how to put them all together. That's what good teaching is. Thanks. What's, what you want? Can I give us questions? Okay. We have time for questions. Anybody have any questions? There's microphones someplace. I can't see them. Are you on a microphone? Okay. Bye. <laughs> That's my standing ovation. Go ahead. But if, any, if anyone has a question, please come up to the mic. If you, actually, if you can't make it to the mic, just raise your hand and yell at me. I'm used to that. I get yelled at all the time. I just can't see. I know. Anyone has a question? This is your last opportunity. What's your question? Flip, flip the classroom. Do I not do that? I'll give you an opinion on it, because I've been called in with a bunch of people who've evaluated it. Flipped classrooms, but I, we had those when I was in school. It was called Read This, Come to Class Prepared. <laughs> now it's Watch This, Come to Class Prepared. All right, so if you're, what are you doing in the flip, except for if, if every teacher flipped, they'd have no life, right? So you have to be very strategic with your flip. And if you're doing it on video, sometimes they don't watch the video, and you're doing, in the class, you're doing what you would have done anyway, because they didn't watch the video. So now you have to have checks on that. Um, do they watch the video? So people are doing now, you know how they do reading quizzes in the textbooks? They're doing watching quizzes on the flipped. All right, so depending on your, I can't say it's right or wrong. What I can say is, um, is if it has to meet your learning objectives, uh, better, than, better than something else. Just a second, yeah.
Nice, okay. She said, um, if I said there's no best practice, that means it's kind of subjective. How would I measure what's best practice for, for, a, for an individual professor? I'm not saying it's subjective. What I'm saying is it's complex. You can use scientific uh, measurements, measure outcomes, measure effort, measure all these things to, this, to, to look and see if what you're doing in your classroom works. That's objective evidence. Okay, you can use objective evidence, but you're a variable. They're a variable. What you're teaching is a variable. You have to, you have to account for those. If that makes sense. So if, if it's test scores that you want, yes. that's important to you, then test scores are one of your variables. Also, motivation might be a variable. My, my question is, oh, oh. do you feel like... I'll get you. Go ahead. Uh, my question is, there's so many uh, programs out there now that are accelerated, and I work in an accelerated program, and you talk about... Time. Pushing the brain and then resting the brain and then pushing the brain and resting the brain. It's very difficult to uh, figure that out when you're accelerated. Do you have any thoughts on that? Or is there too, is there accelerated that's too fast, maybe? Of course there is. <laughs> I can't tell you what it's too fast, though. Um, what I can do, like, if, if organizations should give out grants and actually test the nurses going to practice from accelerated programs to see if they're developed as the kind of nurse that the field wants to see. Does that make sense? Okay? The outcome is a nurse, not a test. It's a nurse that could do their job very, very well and grow as nursing profession grows and adapts over time. Okay? If that's the goal, then we have to measure the outcomes of different kind of programs to see which ones are giving us that type of nurse. Okay? So I can't tell you, I, I can tell you that there's, there's too long. I can tell you there, there's probably too short, but it's an empirical question depending on the kind of um, profess, professionals that you want. We good? Okay. That's all for me. Thanks, everybody. I'll be around. I know I can speak for all of us who feel so fortunate to have heard you this afternoon. This speech was powerful, and it leads us well into a summit because it looks forward to a dialogue and you're t finding all those ingredients and building them into your own repertoire. So thank you. Dr. Daniel will be here through Saturday. And I know he looks forward to even more dialogue about your work and your scholarship. So thank you. Bev? Well, colleagues, we have a few announcements, information that you'll find very useful as you navigate the summit. Make sure you follow the instructions on how to receive your CEUs. Check the procedures on the mobile app or on the poster near the registration booth. As you know, there are very many lunchtime activities during the summit. You must pick up your box lunches in the exhibit hall prior to going to any of these events. I'm supposed to emphasize this, so let me say it again. If you are going to a meeting, that is scheduled during lunch, go to the exhibit hall, first pick up your box lunch, and then head to your meeting place. However, there are two exceptions. If, <laughs> if you are a dean or director or designee attending a special invitational luncheon on Friday, do not pick up a box lunch. All deans and directors should have received an invitation to the luncheon on Friday. If we missed you, please attend. For the fellow luncheon on Saturday again, this is the second exception. Do not pick up a box lunch. Lunch will be served. If you haven't already, please download the NLN Summit mobile app. Stay up to date with the latest announcement and engage with other activities and attendees throughout the activity feed. This year, we are pleased to announce that all conference rooms are equipped with internet connections. The Wi-Fi password is NLN Summit 17, all lowercase. Let me repeat that, colleagues. NLN Summit 17. And now it's on to the welcoming reception, exhibits, and posters generously sponsored by University of Texas at, Texas at Arlington, College of Nursing and Health. A big thank you to Dr. and Dean Ann Bavia. Thank you for coming to Summit 2017. And remember, if you have questions, talk to the staff. 
You are our community of colleagues, and we want your experience here to be flawless. Let's eat. <laughs>